Now we take a look at the examples of suspicious transactions under Appendix B. Right under Appendix B, B1 talks about general comments. Right, uh, this is of course a caveat right, to say that the list uh, given below uh, solely used as an aid. Right, they are examples and not to be uh, applied as a routine instrument in place of common sense. Right, so when we look at suspicious transactions, it's really a matter of common sense. It's a matter of training. It's a matter of the ability of the financial advisor representatives as the frontline people to be able to uh, identify and uh, and spot, as it were, uh, suspicious uh, transactions, right? And you have seen in the newspapers some of the banking staff, right, that has actually uh, done this uh this part of the work in trying to identify suspicious transactions. Okay. Now, uh, the list is not exhaustive. Uh, it's another caveat there. And may be updated due to changing circumstances and changing methods, new methods of laundering money or financing terrorism. Again, financial advisors are to refer to Stroh's website. Okay, The SDRO office, Suspicious Transaction Reporting Office, website for the latest list of red flags. And you cast your eye down a page, and you see the um, the CAD government website regarding AML CFT suspicious transaction reporting office and suspicious transaction report. All right. So it will do you good if you will take a look at the uh, website very quickly, and then be able to see uh, the red flags that have been put up by the. Uh, CAD under straw. Uh, B1.3 talks about a customer, a customer's declarations regarding the background uh, of such transactions should be checked for plausibility. Now, not every customer explanation uh, can be accepted by, by the financial advisor representative or the financial advisor uh, corporation, the financial advisor itself, uh, in terms of plausibility. In other words, uh, don't believe everything a customer tells you, simply put. All right, you must listen to the, 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 the background and then make your own decision to read between the lines, as it were, uh, to see whether there's any uh, reason uh, for you to say that the uh, transaction is suspicious. Okay. Well, of course, it's, it provides that it's reasonable to suspect any customer who is not willing uh, to give you normal information or when you ask for more in additional information, the customer is not prepared to give you the information. So that may cast uh, doubt and suspicion on the customer or the transaction or both. Now, then B2 is a very broad category. It says transactions which do not make economic sense. And they, they give you examples under B1, B2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. All right, six pointers there, six examples there as to show you, as to demonstrate to you why these transactions do not make economic sense. All right, in terms of dollars and cents, it doesn't make sense at all, all right? One, transactions that cannot be reconciled with the usual activities of the customer. All right, that's why it's important to know the nature of the customer's activities. Right. What's the nature of the customer's business activity? What business is the customer in? All right. For example, switching from investment, uh, investing predominantly in blue chips to penny stocks. All right. In terms of, of securities, that is one that does not really make sense. Right. So if the customer s suddenly make changes to the usual activities, right, from blue chips to penny stocks, so that can be a suspicious transaction because it does not make sense, economic sense for that customer to do so. Because as uh, many of you will know, penny stocks are very speculative. All right. Blue chips are relatively safe. All right. So two, a customer's relationship with a financial advisor where the customer carries large, frequent large transactions, which are beyond the customer's apparent financial means. All right. And they give an example there. Request for a single premium contract with a large sum secure. Right, so you look at this particular customer who wants to buy a policy, a life policy from you. 
All right, look at his occupation, look at his income, uh, source of income, right? His salary and, and so on. And then this customer asks you for a very big single premium contract. All right, he wants to insure his life or for, for a big sum of money and one single premium, right? So that could be suspicious, doesn't make sense. Right? Or three transactions where the nature, size, or frequency appears to be unusual, right? I'll give you an example there. A sudden request for significant purchase of a lump sum contract from an existing customer whose current contracts are small and of regular payment only. Again, same story repeated. It doesn't make sense. You must understand the customer's business, the nature of his business, the size of his business. All right? And if there's any sudden change, well, that will put up a red flag. All right? Transaction in which funds are received by way of a third-party check especially when there's no apparent con connection between the third party and a customer. All right? If they are related, family member, or, or some other kind of business relationship where you can see a link, a causal link, then perhaps it is fine. But if there's no connection, no reason, but obviously this part, third party and the customer may be, as it may be, uh, making use of the financial advisor to launder money. It doesn't make sense. All right, and transaction without plausible reason result in intensive use of what was previously a relatively inactive account. Okay, so all this time, all these weeks or months or a year or two inactive or very small transactions that out of the blues, very high use, very frequent use and large uh, uh, transactions are taking place. So that also will cast a doubt. All right, it's a red flag. And uh, six says that request by customer for financial advisory services where the source of fund is unclear or not consistent with the customer's apparent standing. In other words, you must know your client, right? What is his apparent standing, his income level, his occupation status, and so forth. So if you know your client, then you are in a good position uh, to make the assessment uh, to see whether the transactions that the customer requests you to do, uh, request the financial advisor to do, makes economic sense. Okay, so I just pause there for a little while for you to digest the examples given to you. Now moving to B3, uh, the the head, heading there reads, transaction involving large amounts of cash. All right, now in this digital world of today, cash should not be frequently used. All right. Uh, the examples, there are four examples given to you. First is payments made by large amounts of cash. All right, so a person comes to you, buy a life policy and pay you cash for the one, for, for the single premium. Okay. Big amount, big sum of money in cash for a single premium, uh, a uh, uh, life policy, all right? So that is suspicious, right? Because uh, it is risky to carry large amounts of cash around. It doesn't really make sense. And it's difficult to trace the, the where, where the money comes from if the person gives you in cash, all right? So a guideline to what constitutes a large or substantial cash amount would be a cash amount exceeding $20,000. So the guideline is given to you. Anybody comes and pay you more than $20,000 or equivalent in a foreign currency, well, that is defined as a substantial amount. All right, and in which case then a red flag should be posted. Two, customers who funds contain counterfeit notes or forged uh, instruments. All right, so if that person comes to you and uh, gives you cash and uh, among the cash you have one or two counterfeit notes, either in Sing dollar or in US dollar or whatever currency, then well, that would be a transaction involving amount, uh, large amounts of cash or some forged instruments, right? Forged share certificate, forged uh, bond uh, certificates and whatever documents, uh, sorry, so whatever forged instruments uh, the customer may give you, right, for, for the for the business relation or for the transaction. Then three, third example, transactions which money or funds are received from or paid to a customer's bank account in a financial haven. 
Well, the definition is not given to you, the mean of financial haven in this uh, guideline, but I think it is uh, uh, public knowledge, as it were, which are the countries uh, which are uh, deemed to be or considered to be or classified to be financial haven, especially tax havens. Or in a foreign currency, especially where such transactions are not consistent with the customer's transaction history. Again, know your client, know the transaction history. All right, so where the money is coming from, where the money is going to, uh, in accordance with the nature of the customer's business, or the nature of the of the customer per se. All right, the customer he himself or herself, and all of a sudden you find a foreign currency. Uh, coming in or going to um, uh, tax havens, then and especially when you are moving cash, so uh, well that is a suspicious transaction. All right, then for overpayment of premiums with a request to refund the excess to a third party or to a bank account held in a different country, now that obviously is suspicious, right? So that's B3. Now B4 heading reads transaction involving accounts or customer with financial advisors. All right. It's a similar kind of uh, notion, similar kind of idea. Uh, here we are talking about paying in large third party checks endorsed in favor of the customer in settlement for advice, investment service rendered or for other financial services provided. Okay. So what's the reason for pay, paying in third party checks? Especially large amounts, right? And then B four two read substantial increase in deposit of cash or negotiable instruments. Uh, other forms a check is a negotiable instrument, but there are other forms of negotiable instruments like bills of exchange and and so forth by a professional firm or company, but using customer accounts or in house company or trust accounts, especially the deposits are promptly transferred between other customer company and trust accounts. So you do not uh, take the position that trust accounts usually are okay accounts. All right? Some people may use trust accounts as a as, as a front, as a disguise uh, to launder money. Right? So a bit be careful about that one. All right, an account operating name of offshore company with, struct with structured movements of funds and for transfer of funds from various third parties into a particular account which is inconsistent with the nature of the customer's business, right? All right, so a lot of transfer of funds from various third parties into a particular account. And the key point there is not in nature of the customer's business. All right, and then B5 talk about transaction involving transfers abroad. All right, that is, I think, pretty uh, self-explanatory. And then B6 talk about transactions involving unidentified parties. Right, that clearly is a red flag, right? un 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 unidentified parties. All right, B5 and B6, uh, I'll leave that to your own uh, leisure reading. Now, B7 talks about tax-related crimes, uh, tax crimes-related transactions. This we have done earlier under B7. Now, then B8 gives you other types of transactions, all right? and then there's a long detail there, 1 to 8. Okay, subsections uh, 1 to 8. Uh, similar uh, ideas repeated. Account activity not commen not commensurate, underline the word, not commensurate with the customer's known profile. Again, know your client. Okay? Know your client's financial needs, financial situation, investment uh, uh, objectives. Right? If you know your client, then this will not happen, right? So the activity should commensurate with the customer's known profile. Outside the customer's known profile, then consider suspicious. All right? Transactions with countries or entities that are reported to be associated with terrorism activities or with persons that have been designated as terrorists. Again, the same issue. Look at the United Nations resolution. Look at the MAS website. Look at the FATF website, and you will find uh, designated persons. All right. Uh, frequent changes to the address, authorized signatories, and that may also be a red flag. All right. Why, why does a company or a person change its address uh, frequently or changing authorized signatures right, to, to, to the account? All right. Large amount of funds is received and immediately used as collateral for investment. That's also, uh, right. And the person is young. Uh, they define it as 17 to 26. 
okay, opens an account and either withdraws or transfers funds within a short period, which could be an indication of terrorism financing or money laundering. All right, a lot of money launderers they make use of uh, students or or the unemployed, right? Between seventeen and sixteen, young people, more in a way uh, vulnerable, all right, and they make use of them to carry cash around or to open accounts and uh, and do transactions. Right? These are just front people, right? They the front for the money launderers or the um, uh, people who who wishes to launder money to finance terrorist activities. Right. Then six talks about person who receive funds from a religious or charitable organization and utilize the funds for purchase of assets or transfers out of the funds within a relatively short period. So do bear in mind that charities and religious organizations uh, can be made use of uh, by by uh, criminal uh, groups or organizations uh, to launder money and finance terrorism. In fact, some of these... Um, uh, 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 criminal groups, organizations, they do form charitable organizations, right? They do form religious organizations to front their illegal activities. Okay. Then, uh, seven there, customer uses intermediaries which are not subject to adequate AML CFT laws. They come from, uh, jurisdictions which are known, all right? Uh, not to comply with FATF requirements or not member uh, of the not members of the FA, FATF. Okay, all transactions are suspected to be in violation of another country's foreign exchange laws and regulations. So those are just examples, right, given to you, right, so that you can have a better picture uh, in relation to what constitute uh, suspicious transactions, right. I mean, just to, to say all oh, suspicious transactions is easy, right? But how do you, how do you put some, some, some substantiation to the meaning of suspicious transactions? So I, I'm of the view that the examples given to you under Appendix B are broad enough to give you an idea of, uh, how suspicious transactions, uh, can be identified, right? Just a quick uh, recap. So B2 talks about transactions which do not make economic sense. B3 talks about transactions involving large amounts of cash. B4, transactions involving accounts of the customer with the financial advisor. B5 talks about transactions involving transfers abroad. B6, transactions involving unidentified persons. B7, tax crimes uh, related transactions and be it other types of transactions. Okay, so we have done all that. We have done Appendix 6A. We have done Appendix 6B. Now we are done with uh, Chapter 6. Right, now moving on. Let's take a look at Chapter 7. Now, Chapter 7 uh, has three, uh, sorry, four notices. All right, if you look at chapter 7, it has four notices. The first notice uh, is on the reporting of suspicious activities and incidents of fraud. Now, this is different from reporting suspicious transactions under uh, FAA notice number 6, right? This is FAA number 17, 17, right? So, this is the first notice we are going to discuss uh, under chapter 7. Now, the second notice is on the Notice and Technology Risk Management. Right, this is under FAA Notice Number 1818. The third one is Notice on the Distribution of Direct Purchase Insurance Products. This is under FAA Notice 1919. And there's also another Notice on Cyber Hygiene, uh, which is Notice Number FAA and Notice Number 21. So we are looking at 17. 18, 19, and 21 in chapter 7. Now let's take a look at the, at number, at point 2 there. Alright, in chapter 7. As usual, this notice is issued pursuant to section 58 of the FAA. And it applies to all licensed financial advisors. 
Right, underline all licensed financial advisors, and that's also provided for in two point three. Now, two point four says it sets out the requirements for financial advisors to lodge Form F. Right, this is Form F one. Form F one with the MAS within five working days. Underline that, right? So this is a notice; it must be complied with. Right? And uh, you need to lodge within five working days after the discovery of any suspicious activity or accident or fraud that will affect a safety, to soundness, or reputation. Right now, this notice is given to you under Appendix A from the from the MAS website. Right, so Appendix A can be found at the back of this particular chapter. I give you some time to just turn a couple of pages, uh, in your, in your, in your folder or in your Kindle, and then the, we take a look at this particular notice under Appendix Seven A. Right, I hope you're on that page there, Appendix Seven A. So notice number is FAA number seventeen. And the date of issue is twenty third January twenty one three. Uh, that's some seven eight years ago. Right? Some seven years ago. Now, very quickly, look at paragraph two. It is a repeat of what I have uh, uh, said earlier. All right. Report in a form and manner, and within such time as specified in paragraph four. All right. That's paragraph four below. We will come to that later. Upon discovery of any suspicious activities and incidents of fraud, underline the word fraud. Here we are referring to fraud, all right? Where such activities or incidents are material. Okay, the word there is uh, the significant word, the important word there is material uh, to the safety, soundness, or reputation of the finan license of financial advisor. All right, so it impinges on your reputation. All right, it affects the, 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 the soundness and safety of the FA, then you need to lodge the necessary report with the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Now here they are very specific under paragraph 3, for the avoidance of doubt, a licensed financial advisor shall still file suspicious transaction reports to the STRO, Commercial Affairs Department of the Singapore Police Force, as required under FAA Notice Number 6. Right, we have gone through FA number six in great detail. So that one apart, this is something additional. I repeat that, right? This is something additional. This is a uh, regard to fraud, right? So for incidents of fraud, it is a different matter altogether. A licensed financial advisor should lodge a report and submit to the authority a copy of the report. So here you need to lodge a report with the police and submit to MAS a copy of that report. All right, so the reporting is to the CAD, all right, and a copy to the uh, MAS, similar to the suspicious transaction report, but it's a different thing altogether, all right? Where a financial advisor has not lodged a re police report, it should no notify the MAS of the reason for its decision. So you have discovered incident of fraud, and you think that there's no need to report, then why? Right? Give the reason. So number four is quite uh, important for, for, for you to understand. So there's a, there's a prescribed form one, right, which is available on the MAS website for the financial advisor to lodge a report. And here I, I repeat again, not later than five working days, right? So it takes immediate effect. So this is the incident of a fraud report. And to give you more details, right, as to what the report looks like, if you look at the next page there, you will find the report. Now, this report has been submitted by post, fax, or encrypted email under whatever, right? So there you can see for yourself, number one, identification, identification details of reporting financial institution. All right, so the reporting FI, then the officer, uh, destination contact officer, then destination telephone number, email address. All right. So those are the the details of the financial institution making that fraud report. All right. This is called fraud report. 
And then paragraph two, they talk about the details of the suspicious activity or incident of fraud. Right? That is material to the safety, soundness, or reputation of the financial institution. Alright, so you are, you are to provide information as to A, B, C, and D. Alright? So the date and circumstances of discovery, number of clients, users, customers affected by this fraud incident, alright, who has been cheated, alright, who has been uh, defrauded, alright, detail of the persons involved in the suspicious fraud activity, and the money involved, and other relevant information. So paragraph two sets out the, the details, alright, regarding the fraud. The next paragraph, where available, please attach supporting documents such as written and signed statements, investigation reports, and police reports, if any. Right? If the FAA finds that there's no need to do this fraud report, then the reasons why. Okay, that's under paragraph three. Reasons why the activity, uh, oh, sorry, uh, this is the, the materiality part. All right. So why reasons why this incident or why this activity, this fraud ex- incident or fraud activity, the suspicious fraud activity or fraud incident is material? Right? How does it affect the safety, soundness, or reputation of the financial institution? So you have to give a reason here based on two, as you why the incident or the activity right, affects the financial institution safety. Soundness or reputation, right? So four is the reason why you are making that report. How does it affect you in terms of the three uh, criteria set up there? Safety, soundness, reputation. And lastly, reasons for not lodging a police report on, on the incident of fraud. All right, so you discover there could be an incident of fraud and you do not want to make that report. Then the question is why? So to put it simply, when you make a report, you have to give a reason why, right? Why it is important to you, why it's important to the financial advisor, why it's material. The word material means important and, and, and relevant, all right? Uh, to the safety, soundness, or reputation. If the financial advisor feels that there's no need to make a report after discovery of a fraud activity or incident, then give the reasons why not. So yes, also give a reason. No, don't want to file the fraud report. Also give a reason. And then you got to sign it and then you got to date it, right? So that is in relation very quickly to this particular notice, which is a short notice right, in, in relation to the reporting of suspicious activities and incidents of fraud. Now just be very clear and very, very sure, this is entirely different from the 